Um, so this is a talk about consensus in substrate. Um, a big part of the Polkadot vision is that you know, we're connecting a bunch of different blockchains. Uh, and you know, this is great to think about at a very high abstract level. Uh, but of course, it's uh, necessary to have tools for people to actually write those blockchains. So uh, that's substrate. I'm sure Bjorn talked about that uh, a bunch. Basically, it's, it's uh, well, since this is the not quite right slide deck, uh, I'm going to spend a bit of time on just this main slide. So I hope you'll have to bear with me. I'm just going to use words now. It's not going to be any nice pictures. Um, we, the, the, the conceptual model that we use for Polkadot is a fundamental split between uh, state machines and consensus. So consensus algorithms, these decentralized consensus algorithms, are really the key underpinning of uh, blockchain technology, this idea that you, know, you can agree with people all over the world about what the state of a blockchain is, what balances are, what smart contracts have done, uh, what code has been executed, what results have been achieved, what, what events have been observed. Um, so this, this is consensus algorithms agreeing things, those outcomes, uh, and that's what we call the, the state machines. Uh, so the idea with Polkadot is that we have one consensus algorithm that's uniting the state transitions, basically the unique transactions, the unique capabilities of every chain, uh, all united under one consensus algorithm. So this means a, this has a couple of implications, right? So as a developer, for one, uh, you don't need to implement your own consensus algorithm. You don't need to write uh, the code for that, which is pretty tricky, I can tell you for sure, because I've written a few myself. Uh, and the other thing is that you don't have to then gather security resources for that consensus algorithm, right? Uh, you don't have to compete with other chains for miners in a proof of work system. You don't have to compete with other chains for stakers in proof of stake. Uh, so that means that if you have many chains united under one consensus algorithm, that it's generally a lot easier to get a chain rolling. You know, you could think of it as a, as a continuum, right? In the beginning, there was only uh, sovereign blockchains, blockchains that are fully in control of their own destiny, right? Provide their own security, their own state machines of, um, you know, what, what transactions are doing, essentially. And then we had, with Ethereum, we had the invention of, uh, or at least the implementation of an idea called smart contracts. And smart contracts are, you know, pieces of code uh, that all run within the same system, and they, that's the state machine of a blockchain, a, block, a blockchain that's designed only for the execution of smart contracts. As what we do with Polkadot is we end up landing somewhere in the middle. We have something that you can build which is much closer to a blockchain in terms of the control it has over its own uh, capabilities and over, over what is actually executed uh, and how blocks are authored, for instance, with what timing. Uh, but of course, the uh, security of that blockchain is not provided by it itself. It's instead inherited from some root. Um, so yeah, to recap, we have the consensus. What a blockchain uh, is composed of consists of a consensus algorithm. How do we agree on what changes have been made? Uh, and the other half is the state machine, uh, which changes have actually been agreed upon. So. One of the implications that this has for Substrate is that what people are really writing on Substrate is just their, their state machine, you know, what transactions actually do. Um, and you can basically choose from a number of different consensus algorithms. You can choose, okay, I want to run, uh, well, we have, we've invented a consensus algorithm called Grandpa. So I want to run, run Grandpa, and that's going to power the consensus of my chain. Uh, you could also choose, you know, for instance, something like Tendermint or PBFT or Proof of Work, whatever. That's sort of isolated from the logic of actually processing transactions. Um, and the other thing that we've done is we've created a, um, you know, it's a consensus algorithm for Substrate that you can plug into your code base that essentially just says, we're going to follow the Polkadot chain, right? So you can take the exact same code base that you've written with Substrate and just swap out the consensus algorithm. Uh, and, and basically turn it into, into a parachain by that. Uh, so if I would talk a bit about the uh, stack that we use for Substrate, uh, we've got a bunch of stuff. It's written in the Rust programming language. Um, 
we've got the runtime. The runtime is essentially the implementation of this state machine. What does the blockchain do? That's implemented as WebAssembly code. So that's sort of WebAssembly code is something that's interpreted. It's meant to be fast. It's sort of a, a descendant of JavaScript. It's intended to be, uh, it was first intended to be used in the web. Uh, we found that it has very practical applications for smart contract uh, or blockchain virtual machines as well. Uh, so the idea behind putting the runtime into WebAssembly is that you can actually do uh, on-chain upgrades of what the chain actually does. So the chain can say, you know what, I'm just going to change my code mid-flight, and then all the nodes will see that, and they'll just start executing that new WebAssembly code instead of having to, you know, uh, what you would have to do in, in that kind of upgrade system beforehand would be, uh, you know, distribute a client update, and you have to ask your community, hey, everybody, please update. Uh, if you can do on-chain upgrades where you just swap out one piece of WebAssembly code for another, that means that you can basically do these kinds of upgrades of the chain logic, you know, upgrade the staking system, for instance, uh, or change fees or, or, or the economic model uh, without having to distribute a new piece of software to your users. Uh, so that's an immensely powerful tool. So this WebAssembly code is executed uh, and agreed upon by a consensus protocol, and these nodes uh, communicate via libp2p, which is a set of uh, technology is essentially for fully modular peer-to-peer -peer networks. You know, it abstracts fully over what's the transport. You know, probably you'll be using something like uh, TCP connections, perhaps web sockets. It could be carrier pigeon over uh, with, with a USB drive. LibP2P really just doesn't care. Uh, so the fact that we don't have to think exactly about how nodes are talking to each other, we can just say, OK, nodes are sending data to each other. That's a very uh, powerful set of tools. Uh, so. One of the innovations that we made uh, is Grandpa, the grandfather of finality gadgets. So that stands for Ghost-Based Recursive Ancestor Deriving Prefix Agreement. I think before I would go into this, uh, it makes sense to talk a bit about the goals of hybrid consensus. Uh, so you know, how do you actually choose which consensus algorithm you want to deploy a blockchain with? And you might hear the word uh, instant finality from time to time, or you might hear absolute finality in terms like these. So someone might say, okay, this consensus alg algorithm is instant finality. Uh, but that's actually a bit of a, a misnomer. With instant finality, it means that as soon as the block is created, you have finality. But there's actually this time between you know, the block starting to be created and the block actually being created. And that takes longer in instant finality Engine. So uh, the, the term instant finality is a bit of a misnomer. However, it does mean that you never have forks in the blockchain, provided the blockchain is not 51% attacked. On the other side of the spectrum, you have algorithms like proof of work or Aura or Ouroboros, where finality is eventually consistent. You know, you have forks in the near, the recent blocks, uh, but eventually the network sort of sorts out which blocks everybody is building upon. So the idea behind a hybrid consensus algorithm is to use one of these eventually consistent things, which by its own would have much slower or perhaps never guarantee finality, the property that a block would never be reverted. Uh, but when you combine it with a finality gadget, basically another consensus protocol that's running behind the head of the chain to provide even more security on the blocks that are being created, you get the best of both worlds. You can add blocks very quickly because you don't have to do a lot of agreement before releasing a block, uh, but it also means that you finalize very quickly. Uh, so this has been our approach to consensus algorithms. So we've come up with a, uh, a set of two algorithms. We have Grandpa, which is for the old blocks. It finalizes old blocks. Uh, and we have another algorithm called Babe, which is for the new blocks. Uh, so to talk a bit about how Grandpa works, um, it's derived, it's in the family of consensus algorithms, uh, the PBFT, Practical Byzantine Fault Tolerant, uh, consensus. So that was, you know, the, one of the landmark papers in consensus algorithm development, where they essentially came up with this way of doing two rounds of voting, where, you know, I, I, in the slide it says two phases, it's two rounds, two phases, where basically you get two-thirds of people signing off on something, and then two-thirds of people signing off on the fact that they've seen two-thirds of people signing off on the first thing. Uh, and that gives you, as it turns out, a very strong agreement property. 
Uh, so what we do in grandpa is instead of saying, you know, I'm going to propose a block, let's see if we can all agree on this block, we rather have people voting on which chains they see. So I'll say, okay, I see this blockchain, that's the best block I see, and that includes, you know, through its parent and its parent's parent and its parent's parent's parent, all the blocks that came before it. And, you know, someone else might say, okay, I see chain B. But at some point, they have a common ancestor. And what grandpa does is it figures out what's the common ancestor block that everybody, or at least two-thirds of people, you know, accounting for that one-third, which may be dishonest, what's the, the common ancestor of all the chains that people see that can really be agreed upon? And when grandpa figures that out, it basically means that uh, these blocks can't be reverted without paying a, you know, a substantial fee. Uh, that's the property of absolute finality. I mean, of course, everything has a price, right? So if your staker set has $100 million behind it, uh, you can overpower that with 33% uh, plus one of that. So that would be you know, $34 million or whatever. Uh, so what this actually turns out to be is a formalization of the, uh, or it's a, a deterministic variant of the confirmation system that people use in Bitcoin. So in Bitcoin, they'll say, okay, if you look at the last, uh, if you ignore the last six blocks in your chain, probably everybody agrees on all the blocks before that. Uh, and this is a deterministic variant of that where we actually figure out which of those blocks in the history that everybody actually really does agree upon. Uh, so the other algorithm for creating blocks, uh, I, I don't think I'll spend too much time on this, uh, but it's called BABE. Uh, and essentially, the main problem we try to solve with Babe is it's a very practical problem. So a lot of these consensus algorithms that, you know, will say, okay, we're going to pick an author every four seconds or six seconds, and that author is going to author a block. So the problem is that it depends on this definition of absolute time. Absolute time being, you know, that everybody knows exactly when it becomes one second from another. In the real world, people have clocks that are desynchronized. You know, I might be 0.2 seconds ahead of uh, someone else, and that person might be 0.5 seconds behind someone else. Uh, so this relying on absolute time that I know exactly when one, say, four-second interval is starting versus another one uh, clearly does not hold up in the real world. And that little edge where adversaries can exploit timing mistakes uh, actually gives them a decent amount of power to influence the growth of the chain. Uh, so the main problem we try to solve with Babe is essentially that we don't rely on absolute time anymore, but we rely on uh, relative time. So uh, what you do is, uh, well, this is inspired by an algorithm called Ouroboros Prowess. It's essentially a tweak of that to allow for relative timing assumptions. Um, okay, I've, I've, yeah, so this is a diagram of, of, of how an adversary can exploit uh, one of these timing, timing uh, uh, flaws. That's from a paper called Applying the CAP Theorem to Permission Blockchain. Um, this is a diagram lifted from that paper. And this is a diagram of basically how we solve that problem. Uh, it's a bit dense because it's, not, it's obviously not a very simple solution. Uh, but what you do is essentially you observe blocks claim that they were released at a time and you observe what time you actually received that block from the peers in, in your uh, node relative to the time that the block was supposed to be released. And that sort of gives you a way, once you've received enough blocks on the network, to guess like, okay, it seems like everybody else is on this time. So uh, it can drift a bit, but you basically can come up with an overestimate of when exactly any, any particular slot uh, where a block could be released would be. So instead of saying, okay, starting at second one to second five, there's a slot, uh, you would say, okay, I think that this slot is gonna cover seconds 0 0.8 to 5.2. And that's gonna be an overestimate that I've figured out based on observing when I'm actually seeing blocks. I think it's better to talk a bit about cumulus. So as I mentioned before, we have substrate, which is essentially how we expect many teams to go ahead and actually build blockchains that run on Polkadot. Um, Cumulus is a set of libraries for substrate that essentially bridges your code base and turns it into a Polkadot code base. So the, the, the key thing to note about substrate is it's actually, you know, it's an independent technology from 
Polkadot. Substrate, you can write something on Substrate that doesn't rely or care about Polkadot at all. So, you know, you could write a, a, a blockchain on Substrate right now and say, you know, I don't care about Polkadot at all. But the fact is that they are extremely complementary. Uh, and what Cumulus is, is it's, it's a way of, of taking your Substrate code base that, you know, you may have originally intended to be a, uh, a sovereign chain, to be, exist solely in its own bubble, and to turn that into a Polkadot chain. Uh, so basically to take the same code base with barely any code changes and just turn it into a, 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 polka, dot, a polka dot node. Uh, and one thing that you get with Substrate as well is the light client. Uh, so talk a bit about the motivation behind light clients. I think Ryan stressed this a little bit, uh, but I think that light clients are really, really, really an important thing. And they're very, very, very hard to get right. And it's one thing that we see when people are writing their own blockchain node software from scratch, because a lot of teams are doing that, is they'll just completely skip out on the light client and they'll only write full nodes. And the end result there is that you end up some with something like uh, uh, Infura in Ethereum, which is essentially it's a centralized service that so much traffic goes through that, you know, if I want to find out what's going on on a blockchain, I just query some website. And that's not how it's supposed to work at all. But people will use that because full nodes are too heavy. Because full nodes you can't run on your laptop. Because full nodes you can't run on your mobile device. Whereas light clients are meant to be bandwidth light, storage light, and computation light. You sacrifice very little security. Essentially, the security thing that you're sacrificing is that a cartel of bad miners or block producers can make a targeted attack against you as a light client. So if you have a very, very valuable use case, of course, this may be feasible, and it's not something that you would want to use a light client for. But as an average user, light clients are uh, completely fine, right? Because no, if you just have you know, a few thousand bucks floating around in crypto, there's no cartel of miners that's going to say, OK, yeah, we want to we wanna screw this guy over. That's not going to happen. Uh, and the only reason, really, that people don't write light clients is because the protocols behind them are very difficult to get right. Uh, for proof of work, it's very difficult. It's actually more difficult than many proof of stake variants. But even for proof of stake, it's, uh, it's quite difficult to uh, make the, the right security uh, uh, considerations. Uh, so now to just take this back to a 10,000 foot, really big overhead view of what's going on in, in Polkadot. We have a relay chain. This is the main chain. It relays messages, provides security for other chains. Uh, those other chains are called parachains. We've exemplified this with different shapes to sort of indicate the fact that these chains are distinct. We have this idea, essentially, that uh, specialization breeds optimization. You know, the idea that if you are focusing very closely on a specific problem to solve, you can do better at that problem because you're not working within a very general framework. And we see that in smart contract platforms uh, that essentially one size doesn't fit all. Because in smart contract platforms, what you usually do is you have very, very granular operations. You'll say, OK, I'm going to add one number to another number, then I'm going to charge a gas fee. OK, now I'm going to multiply two numbers, and then I'm going to charge a gas fee. And you end up doing like twice the work because you're charging fees after every tiny bit of work. So of course, if you had something that was more specialized, like you know, a chain for file storage or a chain for oracles, that you could very easily say, OK, I'll just charge a fee once at the beginning, and all that other work, you know, that's already accounted for, because I know what kind of operations I'm going to be performing. And this is the idea behind parachains, and it's why we've exemplified them uh, with different shapes, to show that you know, the square chain is not doing the same thing as the triangular chain. And there's also another kind of parachain, from the perspective of the Polkadot technology, uh, they function the same way. But from the perspective of a user, there are also bridges. So basically, you write a bridge to another sovereign blockchain, and this acts as a parachain. But of course, it is bridging over state, you know, tokens, messages, what have you, from, for example, Ethereum to all the chains in the Polkadot network, or vice versa. Uh, so to talk a bit about the anatomy of a parachain, we have the validation function. Uh, so this basically, this, I don't think I'll spend uh, too much time on this, but it basically comes down to one of our other conceptual splits in our model. 
So we have a, a, a conceptual split between the authoring of blocks and the signing off on blocks. Now traditionally in a blockchain, you know, the same people who are responsible for creating blocks are those that are responsible for providing absolute security for them. In a proof of stake system, you know, you author a block and then uh, if it turns out to be bad, you get slashed. So it doesn't quite work like that here. Uh, because we're doing a, uh, a distribution of security over many chains, it's something akin to sharding solutions. The major difference is that the chains are heterogeneous as opposed to homogeneous. Uh, so of course, authoring a block on a specific chain requires knowledge of how that chain functions, right? So you have to know how that mempool looks. You have to know how prioritization is supposed to work, how fees are levied in order to actually construct a block for a given blockchain. So we separate the authoring of a block, the creation of a block, to specific nodes in the system called collators. And the collators send that block to someone called a validator, who is a staker on the relay chain, on that main chain. And the validator's job is to just check that the validation function, this WebAssembly code that's registered on chain, if you put that block into it, that it says, OK, that's good. It can say, OK, that's good, or it can say, that's garbage, throw it out. And validators are essentially, their main job is just check if a block satisfies the validity function, and then do a digital signature. And if that block is ever proven to not satisfy that validity function, that person will get slashed. So what that means is that validators are only relying on the WebAssembly code that's registered on the relay chain. It means that validators don't have to have intimate knowledge of how every other parachain is working. That means that you can add and remove parachains to the system, upgrade, support new future innovations without having to distribute client updates to validators. Because validators always have the same process. Just run whatever a collator for that chain is giving you against a validation function. Um, so how, I guess the main thing to talk about now would be how do parachains actually differ from uh, sovereign chains. What are, what are the real differences? You know, if you wanted to write a node for, like, node software for, for a parachain versus node software for uh, a sovereign chain. So the main difference there is uh, chain synchronization. Because what you usually do when you're synchronizing the chain is you just talk to your peers and you say, um, give, me, give me the next blocks. You can always do something like follow the longest chain. Uh, but when you're following the relay chain and you're drawing finality from another chain, uh, the process is a bit more difficult. We do have the, the ability to always find the most recently finalized parachain block. And the process for that is essentially what's the most recently finalized relay chain block. Look that up, then look in the state of that block, find the parachain header, and then we know that that parachain header is finalized. Um, unfortunately, you know, of course, blockchains, you can take a block, you can go to the parent, you can go to the parent of that, and you can traverse that all the way back to the, the genesis, but this may be a chain that's millions of blocks long. So if you start at the most recent block and you uh, don't know any blocks between that and the genesis, you have to employ some kind of sophisticated methods to actually synchronize those blocks forward. Uh, so the Solution, at least for full nodes, for light clients, they're not downloading all the blocks, uh, bodies, and executing them. So for light clients, just knowing the most recently finalized block, that's the end of, end of things. Uh, for full nodes, you actually have to execute all the transactions in the block. That means, you know, ideally, you want to download them forward. Uh, if you would download them in backwards order, which is much easier, then you have to do download everything, then execute forward. And that takes, you know, probably twice as much time. Uh, yeah, so finding the easiest, uh, finding the, the most recent finalized hash is easy, but finding an older header canonical hash is not. Uh, so the solution is something that we call log two ancestors. Uh, essentially, you keep a table in the relay chain state of all the blocks which uh, in recent time were div had number divisible by some power of two. And what that lets us do is essentially every block is committing to some number of its recent or not so recent ancestors in a table. So if I, you know, if I trust the state of a specific block, I can jump backwards in this table and uh, make a much bigger leap backwards than I would if I would just go into the parent. 
but you also don't use that much space because it's, it's uh, power of twos based. And of course, these grow very quickly. It's doubling every time. So if you keep 32 powers of two, that means that you can already take hops of uh, millions of blocks. Uh, yeah. So I guess just to tie it all together in the end, uh, what Cumulus gives you is a consensus and chain synchronization implementation. Uh, it gives you an implementation of a collator node for authoring parachain blocks. Uh, and you have tools for writing substrate chains that let you plug into the ability to send messages back and forth from one chain uh, to another via the Polkadot relay chain. Uh, you can think of the complementary relationship between Polkadot and Substrate as uh, something like a computer and a network card, right? So at first you had computers which could do their own work, and then all of a sudden you had network cards, which meant that computers could talk to each other. Uh, so Substrate is like the computer. You know, you, you write a blockchain that does some kind of work, it does some kind of specialized computation, and then you have Polkadot, which is the network card that lets blockchains talk to other blockchains and lets you write applications that bridge over many chains. Uh, yeah, so if you would want to get started with Cumulus, it basically just means write a substrate chain and then plug in the Cumulus libraries when they're uh, uh, more finalized. Yeah, so I think one, one last point is that one planned feature for substrate, I think that this is a very interesting feature from the perspective of teams who would want to build a chain, uh, is basically that you uh, can upgrade the consensus algorithm of the chain mid-flight. Uh, so that means that you know, substrate 1.0 is out, right? It, the release candidates at the very least are out. We're finalizing the release of substrate 1.0. That means that you could write a chain on a stable platform now, even though Polkadot isn't intended to be launched until the end of the year uh, for the initial release. So that means that you could actually write and deploy a chain now. You, know, you don't have to wait for Polkadot's launch. You could deploy something now. And then when Polkadot is launched, you can change the consensus algorithm on and turn it into a parachain. Vice versa as well. You know, parachains are uh, allocated via a market for parachain slots. Uh, so if at some point your chain would sort of lose the, lose the interest of the Polkadot community and it wouldn't win a parachain slot in the, next, uh, in the next round of auctions, then you can also migrate back off of Polkadot, which means that for your chain, losing your parachain slot is not a death sentence. It means that your chain can continue to exist. Uh, so we find that, especially for developer teams, that this is a very, very practical approach. It means that you're not 100% locked into Polkadot. You can reap the benefits of Polkadot, but of course, you don't have to rely on it 100%. And if you have an orthogonal product, you don't have to care about Polkadot at all. And I guess we'll just end it there. We are running a bit late, uh, but we probably have time for a question or two. A oh, question. Hello, good morning. Congratulations for the presentation. Thanks. I would like to ask if it's possible to use Substract in other blockchain architectures or even DAGs. Is it on the roadmap? Is it possible? Yeah, so the question is whether we would connect, be able to connect DAGs on Polkadot. Yeah, so I think that this falls into the category of uh, bridges, right? So the bri a bridge would be anything that connects Polkadot chains to chains uh, or systems that provide their own security, and DAGs are clearly doing that. Uh, then the question is uh, mostly about uh, how much, at what point can you determine a, a, a transaction in a DAG to be final, right? That it won't be reverted, because if you would bridge over some value from a transaction on a DAG to a Polkadot chain, and then this DAG were attacked, of course, this could lead to big trouble. Uh, but assuming that there is a mechanism to do so in a DAG, that you have a good metric for when there's enough, say, weight on top of a, a transaction, uh, it's completely possible to build a bridge over it. Yeah. Yeah, question over there. Yeah. I was still a little bit confused between uh, uh, bridges uh, and, um, hold on, <laughs> if, if you were uh, uh, using a, re when do you use a relay chain and when do you use a bridge to a chain that, that uh, has its own consensus? 
So a, um, a relay chain is, uh, it's essentially the Polkadot blockchain. So it's sort of like a global entity that anybody can plug into. Uh, so a bridge would be for connecting a you know, chain that provides its own security that doesn't rely on the relay chain directly. Um, so then I think the question is more like, when do you build on the relay chain and you just say, okay, I'm gonna inherit all security from the relay chain, or when do I just and, and over from that? Uh, and it really depends on how much security resources your community can amalgamate, right? Because if your chain has weak security, of course, a bridge means that the chain could be attacked and then you could you know, have a double spend, essentially. Uh, so I think it comes down to practical considerations of you know, how much message latency you're willing to accommodate uh, because message passing within the relay chain is faster than with bridges uh, and how much security your chain can provide.